John. Good to see you. Hi, John. Thank Good to see you right there. All right. Okay. And we uh, we made a point actually uh, knowing uh, John's requirements of stocking up on on Red Bull. Uh, before he came on. I get on. a little fired up. I'm going to give this a try. Yeah, I, going. I was hoping to hear a few more minutes about the CenturyLink transformation. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> <You guys. laughs> I, do I dozed off right at the three. Well, based on the video from the kids, it sounds like you have some marketing work to do with the uh, generation under 10. Well, not with the last kid, not with Ty at the yes, end. Yes, yes. I, I'm still stuck on the one that had to take a piss earlier today. Yeah, that was my son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, John, it seems like, from the outside at least, for the last two years at T-Mobile, you have been having a ton of fun. What have the last couple of years been like for you uh, as you put this in the context of your broader career? Yeah, well, listen, first of all, this, this event's been fantastic. Uh, I woke up this morning to the drone guy and the robotics uh, watching it stream, but give me a break. I see Pooch. I mean, <laughs> kids, dogs, you shitting me? I was pissed right then. I was trying to call in sick saying, there's no freaking way I'm going in after that genius woman. <laughs> uh, and she was fantastic. Well, the, well great, was great. the great thing about her, we thought she had headed back to Spokane this afternoon. It turns out she was over in the other ballroom doing her homework when she heard her name <laughs> announced as the winner. So it puts things in some and, perspective. And the other thing I was going to say, I, I want to give you credit for um, I don't do these things, uh, you know, these events where everybody goes and tells each other how wonderful they are and what geniuses uh, they are. I think that was Karen Waltz, <laughs> sorry about that, part today. Um, but what happened, we were on Twitter and he said to me, you know, John, we come speak at the event. And of course, I'm selling all the time. So what I said was, I'll do it if you go switch to T-Mobile. And the next thing I know, I get the photo of him in the store <laughs> waving the device around. So it was, uh, it was well done. He caught me into it. We'll um, do whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, this last two years have been a ball. I mean, it's, you know, I've said a couple of times, it's um, on so many fronts, it's like, if you're ever in Asia and you have to go sing karaoke, you want to sing after the shittiest singer. And, <laughs> and you know, not, not just Timo, I'm not saying that these guys that ran the place were a bunch of schmucks, but it was, it was the industry. It was, it was just the perfect time to come in. And um, I, I could tell you, I could do a reality show on, see for me, I like, uh, it's not like I'm Howard Stern or anything. I, I like the shock very, I like to use humor and things. But to me, if I do something and you laugh, it's funny. If you don't, I think it's even funnier. I just, I just <laughs> like that. And, and I would have to tell you, John Ledger meets Deutsche Telekom has to be one of the funniest things that's <laughs> ever happened. I mean, we're the uncarrier. If you look up carrier in the dictionary in German, it's them. And, and then, you know, kind of me uh, entering into that. Um, but it's been, it's been a ball. There's an awful lot to do. Um, obviously, it's a lot more fun right now because we're growing like crazy. And you know, we, in the last five quarters, we've been the fastest growing wireless company in the US. We've, you know, we're about 55 million customers uh, now. We've added 7.6 million. I won't take you through the stats because I'll, you know, I'll be down three, two, one. Um, <laughs> but you know, August was, it was the biggest growth month in the history of the company. Uh, I'm tempted to tell you about September, but let's it's only it. uh, October yeah, 1. Do we want to no, ask I mean, on that? <laughs> listen, I, and I, as we get into questions, I, there's a lot that's going on in the wireless industry that can be explained by what's happening in the competitive environment. We're kicking the shit out of these guys right now. We are, we are porting on a postpaid side about three to one with everybody, you know, all of them, not, you know, not just Sprint. I mean, Sprint has made a huge inroad, but with us, they've gone from porting on a postpaid side from four to one to three to one. I and mean, that's not exactly worthy of a task force. And you know, we've gone from two to one or so in the last few weeks to three to one with AT&T and Verizon. So you know, what we're doing is, is and that's fun. That, you know, that makes a lot more sense. So it, September, no, September just ended. We're in October. Can you say anything yeah, about September? No, and are, you mean, ahead, are you ahead of Sprint now? Did you surpass uh, them this past no, month? I, I, no, I don't think, I don't, no, not yet. Yep. I'm, I'm thinking things. You're about 50 million, they're about 54 I'm million. I'm thinking, you know, right during that shitty football game where Detroit plays every year on Thanksgiving, <laughs> it should be, should be about. Or maybe the good one later, the Hawks versus the 49ers. You know, I, I actually made an, uh, a, a forecast a couple weeks ago that we were going <laughs> to, we were going to, after we go after Sprint, we're going to surpass AT&T. And I, one of you pricks that you know, writes, I, somebody wrote, at the current uh, trajectory and speed, it will take them 15.2 years or so. 
uh, obviously a lot would have to change to move there, but uh, yeah, so far so good. So I, I know we're joking around here. There was actually some, some serious news that was uh, out today, uh, reported by Bloomberg News, that Iliad, uh, for the Fran French telecom company that has its eyes on T-Mobile. It's that porn guy, right? <laughs> it's a guy with it's, a long hair. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> is this how you diffuse tough questions? Is this how you do it? No, I, mean, I can tell you everything you need to know about Iliad. The owner's wealthy, he's got long hair, he made his money in porn, and his wife is the heir to the Louis Vuitton money. I mean, shit, what else do you need to know? Uh, I don't know what else they do. So, uh, you, you said you don't know what else they do? Yeah, my name, I, I, as of this morning, I started calling myself John Legere. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, listen, I, there was, uh, I'm so sick and tired of the, you know, it must be a, a slow day. I mean, we have rumors about rumors. There's a rumor that the rumor that they were going to make an offer for T-Mobile, that the rumor was that was rejected. The rumor is that they're going to make a bigger offer. And, I, you know, it's just, it's craziness. Uh, we, we have been subject to this. We will be subject to this for the foreseeable future. And I can give you a list this long who, you know, would salivate to find something with T-Mobile. Uh, you know, my strategy has been continue to grow, focus on what we're doing. I don't want my employees getting their heads on sideways. They still have PTSD for when AT&T almost bought, you know, tried to buy them, uh, which I appreciate the five billion they gave me, which I used to invest in our network to now beat them, which is really, it's a tough strategy to execute, but, you know, it works. <laughs> um, and, you know, and then we went through the, you know, the rumors and the rumors of Sprint and us. And now this is clearly somebody who is trying to raise money because he's fascinated uh, you know, with T-Mobile. The only thing I would tell you too is, it's not just about, you know, most of the mergers in the industry have been about somebody that's totally dead, that somebody comes in and buys them for synergy and takes their spectrum. What's happening is T-Mobile now, is a, it's a brand. I mean, there, there's something very strong and valuable going on. And, Obviously, here's the plug line. I have a fiduciary obligation to shareholders to look at any and all offers that come into the company. Bullshit. I mean, so we'll see. <laughs> but, but there'll be more, right? There'll be, a, there'll be a lot of interest. And frankly, over time, there are multiple ways for us to succeed in the industry, standalone or in, a, you know, in various consolidation scenarios. Well, at the time the potential sprint merger was pending, you actually, we met you in your tour bus outside the, the Paramount <laughs> Theater. And, and you made it clear that one of the obvious ways that T-Mobile could gain traction and actually uh, add more spectrum would be through consolidation. Sure. Obviously, Sprint didn't happen. Can T-Mobile truly succeed long term if you don't merge with another carrier or somebody who has a lot more wireless spectrum? Listen, five quarters are net additions of customers, 7.6 million. We'll probably add 8 million this year. You know, it's, it's the good old fashioned way of continuing to grow and, you know, drive. The network's performing, customer services, JDP number one, all that stuff. So yes, we can be a very profitable growing company. The trick though is that, you know, it's a scale industry. Um, and, you know, and I, and I was always clear, yeah, if, if, you, if you had um, thought about putting Sprint and T-Mobile together, you'd have immediate scale. You know, it would be something good. You know, as long as you called the T-Mobile and I ran it, it would be successful. Uh, any other version of that yellow school bus would crash right into the fucking wall. Um, so, so those are, you know, those are variations. But yeah, we can have a successful standalone business, or we can we can consolidate. So, if, if you look at your tenure at Global Crossing, it, it was certainly not. <laughs> you want to pull out the pictures of my hair yeah, in Congress? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually didn't do that. I, I know others have done that. But, but it, you seem to have gone through a transformation uh, as you've come to T-Mobile. What happened? Where, where is this? Who is this guy? Is this you? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, come on, I'm 56 years old, um, and, you know, I'm kind of, this is a, this is a consumer business. I, I would say in, in the lineage of our careers, not, you know, yeah, you're a bunch of tech geniuses here. You guys can do whatever you want, and then you make a shitload of money. You know, I had a, you know, kind of a, a, a business career, and, and there's a certain kind of what you have to do to move up a paramilitary hierarchy. And, you know, and now, you know, when I got here and kind of experimented with who are my customers, who are my people, uh, the average age of my employees is about 28 years old. Um, you know, the population of young, tech-savvy people are, you know, interested in T-Mobile. So I was just able to be who I am, and it matches our brand. 
So talk about your Twitter personality <laughs> as well, because you are one of the more uh, outrageous uh, commenters and tweeters that's out there. Is Why are you so active on Twitter? I think you're one of the folks that, if, if I retweet or get in touch with you, you're Listen, like automatically on it. And who's, for, on, it who's on Twitter? Not. I didn't mean right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, this is this is a first of all, most of what you say to me is uh, it's you are and then it's versus CEOs. This is not that hard of a club to stick out in. I mean, you know, yeah. come on. These are, you know, I mean, look look at the look at the CEO of AT&T. I mean, the guy is like running a small nation. He's on Obama's. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. The, that guy on the side, though, is a little scary, though, isn't he? <laughs> I have nothing bad to say about Marcelo. Because <laughs> he's going to kick your he ass. Could, he, he could hurt you. <laughs> uh, Pat, but, but uh, they, you know what these guys do for a living? You know, like Randall, you see him on TV, and he talks about the Council of Economic Advisors. That's what, that's what he's got to do every day. I don't, I went to Washington one time and I met with the Secretary of Commerce and I walked in with, with this shirt and jeans on and I think she almost called security when she walked in because she didn't know. And the worst part is I was taking photos of the rug and tweeting them out and I almost didn't get out of the building because I was, they said you can't take photos and when they weren't looking I was in the elevator taking pictures of the seal <laughs> and, uh, and I remember she was, well, getting off track. But the um, Twitter, so I'm at dinner uh, with my daughter. Uh, I, have, I have two daughters. One's a DJ and one's a gamer. And, you know, the two. And the, the gamer and I are at dinner. And she says, hey, we should you put you on Twitter. So I joined Twitter and we we're sitting at dinner. And all of a sudden, corporate security called and said, John, somebody's on Twitter, imposter as you. And I said, no, shit, it's me. I mean, lighten up. <laughs> and then the lawyers and security were coming in and reg FDs and, you know, and, and all that kind of uh, happy horseshit. And the funny part was, I remembered like one of the first days I was on Twitter, then somebody engaged me from HR and they said, John, what advice do you have for a young and aspiring executive as to how they should focus early in their career? And so my daughter and I talked and I replied, play World of Warcraft, get to level 90. And that was it. Now the nerds in here will know. And then all of a sudden it exploded. And are you with the Alliance or the Horde? For the Horde. And you know, and I and 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 it was, you know, and then I realized I was Batman. And what ended up happening then is this connection that's now um, I think I've got five hundred and sixty thousand followers, but my followers have an average, you know, of a couple thousand, and you look at all this. What's happened with me now is, one, um, I listen and I respond. Uh, I think last night I had a little too much to drink and I, there's some guy was complaining about things in our pricing and I said, what's your number, I'll call you. And I think I was slurring into the phone to the guy. But the net result is he was pretty impressed uh, that I called him. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I did it quick enough that he wasn't smart enough to record me, but I said, yeah, you're new to pricing. <laughs> Um, and I use Twitter. I do all my own email. I do all my own Twitter. And, and, you know, back to the guys with the suits, one of the things that's critical, you know, the reason I know they're not going to be able to take advantage of what I do, there's no fucking way anybody's going to spend their day doing what I do. <laughs> I wake up in bed and I do Twitter for an hour and a half just to catch up, right? But what's in there outside of the jokes? Did anybody read my National Poetry Day tweet today? Is that great? Today's National Poetry Day, right? So my tweet was, AT&T is blue and full of poo. T-Mobile is magenta and will help you save money to pay the renta. Come on, <laughs> was that good? And you know what's the saddest part? Is I sat there and typed that right during Walt Moss, for, you know, his presentation. <laughs> um, but here's the, so that's the kidding side. The, the, the truth is, I learn almost everything I need to know to run T-Mobile in there. On the email from individual customers or on Twitter. I take every tweet that comes in and I read it, I forward it to people, my executive team gets them, we reply, and in my staff meeting every Tuesday, we track social media impressions, what they are and how we've responded to them. So uh, it takes a ton of time, it's a lot of fun. 
and it's, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be real and you gotta be out there, but I'm having a ball with it, but it's full-time duty. You also listen to customer support calls that come in as well, so w what are you listening for specifically there and what do you learn? For, yeah, again, you gotta find the fun in everything. Sounds boring, right? No, trust me, this is, this, so what I do is I have an observation number and I can go in and let's say it's, you know, it's evening and I'm home and I really don't have any friends to begin with anyway, as you can suspect. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I can dial in and I can listen to the calls, but they don't know I'm there. And, you know, you can learn so much, you know, if you listen to these calls, first of all, customer care is the brutalist job on the planet bar none. And, and then second is, when you go to your staff meeting on Tuesdays, you know, when you get to the level I'm in, you know, is, it, not my guys, but in general in a paramilitary hierarchy, you get told what you want to hear, right? I think whatever you're thinking is correct. How do you do it? I wish I'd thought of that. That's, you know, that's in effect, you know, so you need to, you need, you need data. And so what we do is, you know, as some of the guys are here, is in the staff meeting, if somebody says, oh no, that plan's been widely accepted by everybody, but the calls from the customers are, you know, viral and pissed, it doesn't stand up. And I think that's, you know, that's how we use it. Last piece for the entertainment side is you can even listen to the IVR. So next time you're calling in, I might be there. And then the IVR will answer and say, how can I help you today? You know, press, you know, the whole deal. And then you listen to the customer and the customer says, ah, my fucking boat doesn't work and there's a guy on the side of the road and I gotta, you know, I gotta do something. And then the IVR says, oh, you wanna talk to sales? And then the, the person will scream, I don't fucking talk to sales. I can't make a phone call, you suck. I wanna kill you. Okay, <laughs> sales it is. And then, you know, um, and, I, and I say that as a joke, but that is, those experiences are what I and my team did two years ago when we started this. And all of our uncarrier moves came from there. And the changes that we made to our systems and how we run customer care are just from listening to those calls, individuals. So, you know, keep it coming. I mean, all the right answers are there. Yeah, so I think you're up now to uncarrier eight. Uh, seven. Eight's seven. coming. Eight's coming. Yep. Uh, Mike Seaver in the front row will tell you what it is. Just get your pens. Buy him a drink. After the second drink, he'll tell you anything. That's <laughs> telling you. Mike, Mike Seaver, longtime uh, executive in the tech executive in the Seattle region, uh, the chief marketing officer at T-Mobile. The chief marketing officer. He's a genius. And events like this cause me so much pain because the fucker's really smart. And then when you bring all these people on the stage and they talk about how much, who's the guy that was saying he can't walk down the street because he's made so much money? <laughs> then he, see, he can do that. But he's now doing this job and I need him. And then after this event, he goes home and he gets finicky. I should go back to a startup. And then I stroke him and tell him how important he is and you can be the CEO someday. And so. so I, you forgot I, your question yeah, now, right? I, I, know, I know you probably, well, what is Uncarrier 8.0? No, uh, you know, the, I can answer two ways. One is the plethora of opportunities to solve customer pain points is limitless. Um, second is I've always made the case that sometimes when I announce an uncarry move's coming, I may not know what we're going to do. And then I listen to the rumors and people go, I know what it is. And then we come and have a meeting and say, hey, that was pretty good. What do you think? <laughs> let's, uh, let's do that. Um, that's BS. Come on. That's not true. You never know. You never know. No, Todd, I mean, you can help spark the I, next part of Uncarrier 8. I will tell you, um, you know, part of my team and the way we run the company is we move really fast, right? And, you know, like we literally can get things decided and launched and out the door in an, in an unheralded amount of time. These Uncarrier moves in the beginning, let's just think about it. From an iCarrier 1 standpoint, simplified pricing was really important, no contracts, right? Getting into complete transparency and then equipment installment plans kind of set the stage. But the first initiatives were about how you buy. And now we're moving into how you use. So music streaming, I mean 65 million songs a day are streamed free or 7,000 terabits of music since we launched it. And then we did Wi-Fi Unleashed, you know, last week. There's a, there is really a secondary aspect to our uncarrier moves, and I think they're playing into the brand. We literally want to change the industry, right? 
And sometimes we do things that, you know, there's not a long-term competitive advantage to it. Like with Wi-Fi Unleashed, you know, the other guys can do this at some point, but they won't. They just won't get to it. But ultimately, kicking and screaming, they'll make the changes, and I think the brand and the company will benefit from the fact that we're the one that forces the industry to change. And, uh, and there's quite a few more, and we're going to keep them coming. You've got an iPhone 6 Plus over there, and I note that it is perfectly straight. Wait, let's just Perfectly see. straight. You're going to bend it? Yeah. Let's see if you can uh, that bend That is this one. such horseshit. Come on. <laughs> you know, listen. What the fuck did you need to see? The video of the guy that's doing this, and if you could have seen his face, he probably would have been purple. The veins were coming out of his fingers, and the thing moves a little bit? Are you shitting me? I mean, when's the last time you took any other, this is an amazing supercomputer in your hand. The fuck are you putting it in your pants and sitting on it for? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. You, I mean, give me a, you know what? Those nine people that sat on their phones, first of all, they need jeans that fit them a little better, because if, if your jeans are cutting your phone, and what idiot, I mean, give me a break. Take your laptop, you know, do handstands on it, throw it against the wall. That's a bullshit. This thing doesn't fucking bend. Let's try it. Did anybody bend one in here? T-Mobile will reimburse you. Oh, you, you, can't, you, can bend you one. can't get one. <laughs> you don't know if it's yes, going to bend. Yes, that's right. <laughs> let, but let me help you about Bendgate or whatever it was. It's not slowing down demand. This, the demand for, for these devices in the last few weeks is unbelievable. Um, and one of my biggest problems right now is, you know, I'm facing a barrage. Again, do all my own email, do all my own. People are pissed um, because they can't get them. And, it, you know, it's a hard issue because it's, you know, there's a major, major supply issue. I do want to tell you, though, one, any of you folks, if they do appear, remember, you, there's nothing that would stop you from buying a Verizon AT&T or Sprint device at the Apple store and coming over and putting a T-Mobile SIM in it. So just a little, little, a little inside advice. So, so it doesn't bet. It's really amazing device. So it was interesting because one of the wraps on T-Mobile, particularly before you came aboard, was the fact that it did not carry the, the iPhone. And you've gone from that to actually having what appears from the outside to be a tighter relationship with Apple than any of the other carriers. You did the uh, test drive, you know, the cheat on your carrier initiative. You're doing the, they shouted out to you at the Wi-Fi calling, and I, I see you're tweeting as I'm asking this question. ADD. Mike, did you just hear that we've got a great relationship with Apple? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it, that's the way it appears to me. What have you learned? What have you guys learned from you know, the collaboration with Apple on these initiatives? Listen, a couple things. Um, so a few months before I took the job at T-Mobile, um, I went in and I had a list um, of, I kind of interviewed them, strangely, of I would be interested in this job if, and let me help you, a blind man could know what T-Mobile needed to do, right? Which is the network needed significant investments, we need spectrum at every corner, we needed to relaunch the brand, we needed to push consolidation, right? Um, but first and foremost on my list back then was go get the iPhone. Crawl over if you need to. Slide into the building. Do not pass go. Don't collect $200. No iPhone. And not just because it was the iPhone. Store traffic was incomplete. People weren't going to go to a store unless it had the full portfolio of devices. Starting then, when we created the relationship with Apple and we were modernizing our network and we were doing BYOD, what I learned with Apple is that their quality focus is incredible and it's made us a better company. So they forced me through the modernization of HSP Plus and the rollout of LTE much faster than I would have because they wouldn't give me the device unless I had a certain quality and a focus. So my lead now on Sprint and others on a network standpoint came from trying to get that iPhone. So this was all the way back. What we just did with them on uh, Volte and Wi-Fi calling, again, really tough quality focus, but now I think we've got a, a real competitive advantage. And surprisingly, this test drive that we're doing you know, is, a, is a big deal with them. So they're tough, but um, you know, I think they've had a big impact on us. And I think this event that just took place, I, I, think, we, uh, I think you're gonna find we did, we did more than our fair share.
which is good. So yes. you sold more iPhones than the other carriers? Well, I don't know about volume. Remember, we've got 15% market share. So you know, part of this game is there's two things that have to be fun, right? Is if we would have a people have a debate with me, is your network really faster than Verizon? So and we can have a long debate and we'll get shit faced and it'll be interesting. <laughs> but you know, the, the victory lap for me is we're having the debate. Who would have thunk two or three years ago somebody would be debating with T-Mobile about the data capability and speed of the network versus Verizon? But we have 15 share points, which means as this game goes on, all we need to do is gain you know, X amount of share periodically. So when you get into the iPhone event, trust me, AT&T better have sold the most iPhones, right? I mean, because technically, you know, every person on the planet had the iPhone from them eventually, you know, and they, it sucked and, you know, the speeds were slow. But I would think relative to our size, I, w I would think history may end up showing that we were the biggest share taker in the event. So let's talk about another device. You gave Amazon a lot of grief when they launched the Fire Phone because they launched exclusively with AT&T. What, what do you think of the Fire Phone and its prospects? I, you know, listen, is it, is it really? Have you never helped That's one? pretty good. <laughs> um, can you sit on that one? <laughs> yes. No, you, you, you listen, were come visibly on. upset I didn't with them. get, <laughs> I wasn't, it, it was the day before one of my events, and I only took a few interviews and said a few things, and I did. I didn't pablum. I didn't go, oh my God, I think it's beautiful, Jeff. I can't believe it. Uh, what I said is, I said, yeah, I, I don't know, one of those things that's really good is you can point this at something, and it'll tell you what you're looking at. And I said, I usually fucking know what I'm looking at, you know, <laughs> most of the time. Um, except on Friday nights when I don't give a shit what the phone tells me, I'm not going to know what I'm looking at. And I don't really want to know. Um, and I think the decisions on the two-year contract with AT&T, yeah, Amazon's big, a great company. I use Amazon to do everything, right? Um, two or three things came to my mind back then, and they stay in my mind. I bet the decision to do this with AT&T over two years happened over two years ago. That wasn't made in the last six months. It was an archaic legacy kind of decision. Um, and, you know, I, I just think it was a bad play for the model. What, what I did suspect is, like everybody else, I was waiting, whoa, what are they up to? They must be doing something with Prime, because I use Amazon Fresh, and I use Prime shipping for everything I do. And I said, you know, the only thing that could make this a horrible event is if what Amazon was doing is going into the phone business because they just think they're better at it than anybody else. And sadly, it looks like that's what they were doing. Now, give me a break. I mean, this thing sold about 10 units. And I mean, if you go into an AT&T store, they had that nice big booth, and I sent Dave Carey, who works for me, we went in the Bellevue Mall, and I went in, you know, and I, I can't really walk in anywhere. Um, but I said, Dave, go, go in there. This is a couple weeks ago. Go in there and find out about the Amazon phone. So Dave, you know, Dave walked in and he went to talk to the person and the woman said, yeah, we, we don't really know anything about it. Uh, but, you well, know. This was the same problem that Windows Mobile had initially. What, what do you think of Windows Mobile? What is Mo this thing, though? I'm looking at, <laughs> is that like the only thing you've got is the plane? <laughs> what, what do you think of Windows Mobile's prospects? I bet porn's so, really good. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> come on. So, no, but it is a good point because you guys do carry Windows Phone as well. And, and it's, so what, what are Microsoft's prospects long term in the mobile industry? And, and do you need them to be a counterpoint we need, to Android? Listen, we want more than anything, we want them all to be highly successful. It's, it's great for us. There's two or three, a couple things, and I don't want to rewind the tape too much. One of the big things that I've been trying to do with simple choice and transparency is stop the charade that carriers are in the OEM business. We don't make phones. And so the sooner we could stop the bullshit, like happened on this, that, hey, guess what? This phone's free. I mean, look at the Verizon commercial. Free. That thing's free. It costs a shitload of money. And as soon as we make sure everybody knows that every carrier pays the same thing for this, then I can get better connectivity between OEM providers and customers and make them compete for your business. Our capital goes into our network spend to give you a quality of service capability. So yes, I also do believe that Microsoft will be successful. Some of their later products have been, you know, have been focused 
you know, very nicely. We've had some good success with a couple. Um, I spent a couple of times with Stephen Elop, and he's very committed to delivering some phones. I think it's, I think it's going to be important for us. I hope Amazon does too. I love Amazon. So would you carry the Fire Phone if they offered it to you? Um, in order to be in our stores now, you have to be a Wi-Fi enabled device. Um, and we have, we have had a number of discussions with Amazon over the past few years. But what's important for us is, you know, we're not going to pant up to somebody, you know, just because, oh shit, what's going to happen if we don't have that device? If customers want the device and it's going to be successful, we're the fastest growing wireless company in the world. You're going to want your device in our stores. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the first uh, hint at this uh, end of device subsidies that, that John's talking about was actually mentioned at the first GeekWire Summit in two, in years, ago. two years ago in 2012. And that was the story that kind of went viral out of, out of that conference. So since that time, you know, you've, you've executed on a plan to kind of blow up the model in the wireless industry. It's still very, very messy. Uh, you're probably not as far down the, the path as you'd like to be on, on cleaning things up. But what are the big messes that still need to be addressed in your mind to okay. end that device subsidy Listen, plan that you talked about? I was uh, you know, about getting to be a year and a half ago or so when I was in Las Vegas, and I became possessed with anger on the industry and kind of outlined you know, what we were going to change. So many of those things have translated into industry change. And I'll just remind you, like, just take uh, Uncarrier 2, which was Anytime Upgrade, or, you know, John, upgrade my phone, jump. Um, that has become industry standard. It's like now, you know, upgrade programs are, are everywhere. Um, my biggest focus on what's left to change in the industry now is the trickery is back. Right? We have to be vigilant, and what we have to do is maintain our focus, and the trickery is back at an all-time high. Verizon has decided that they make so much money, 55 points of EBITDA margin, they have between AT&T and Verizon, they're bigger than the GDP of Denmark or Portugal, right? And they control almost 90% of the profitability in the industry. So what they've decided to do is hang back and stick to the contracts and the trickery. And so what's happening now is people are going to change to new devices and, and they're calling me and they're saying, how the hell can you charge me X when Verizon charges Y? So the trickery of the two-year contracts is back. Um, Sprint, Sprint came out with a $20 a month rental plan on an iPhone. Do you know what that is? I mean, did everybody figure out that, that game? It's a two-year contract. It's an equipment installment financing with no residual value. So you spend two years in a contract, you have no ownership, you give the phone back, which is worth more than the amount that you're getting it for, that's trickery. And I think that's, that's the piece. You know, the fundamental underpinnings of transparency, visibility, and simplification, like four lines for 100, you know, people don't want big crazy data buckets, they want unlimited plans, that's what we need to, that's, that's the main thing that I've got to stick to. Is that a jawbone that you've got on? Yeah. Yeah. So, I like the sleep thing. Yeah. yeah you know, somebody said today we're going to compete on that stuff. I can outlight sleep any of you. <laughs> I sleep like a baby. I wake up every 20 minutes and cry. <laughs> <laughs> where, where does See, I'm so old. These were funny 25 years ago, <laughs> but you weren't there. It's fantastic. I can recycle that shit. It's beautiful. How do, how do wearables and the Internet of Things and just this whole de de connected device environment, how does that fit into T-Mobile's strategy? And, and where do you see that going? How quickly will it get here? Yeah, it, see, there's a couple things. That what we're not doing is we're not going to lose our focus as to where, where we're going, right? Um, and I think competitively, some of the guys are trying to cascade their profitability in this part of the market and veer them out into the home, into the car, into other areas. We're going to stay very focused here. However, wearables are, as you know, exploding, right? So I think in the last year, which I always look at, the developer community has gone from 4% focused on wearables to about 27%. So the ingenuity into wearables is going. I think there were some great discussions here today where you guys get where this is going. It's embedded into clothing. It's all over the place. Um, and I think it's going to play big for us. I think it plays to our strength, especially because we skew very high with the young tech-savvy group. Um, so nothing, you know, it's a big focus of ours, but no, we won't try to create it. And I think we'll do a lot more partnering and a lot more 
kind of making ourselves available to you know, to this community. So one wearable device that a lot of people uh, use is, is the Fitbit. I just wanted to bring that up because something that people might not know about you is that you run a lot of marathons. So what, what, have, you, what have you learned in running marathons that you've been able to apply to T-Mobile? Yeah, and, and unfortunately you're asking me this in the, in the first two years at T-Mobile, the biggest thing that I've gained more than customers is like 25 pounds or so. I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of eating my way through. Um, but I have done it. I, I run, um, you know, I, I was a nationally competitive runner up until two years ago as well. And I think in the past 10 years, I've probably run 20 or 25 marathons. Uh, statistically, I've also seen 6% of S&P CEOs run marathons, but the companies they run are worth 5 to 10% more value. You can come up with any stat when you're trying to plug <laughs> yourself. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it, 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 how many people have ever run one? Okay, that's a pre pretty high percentage of a nerd community having run <laughs> marathons. Now, it's, it's the same deal. Uh, I knew when I got here that this was going to be a long road. And it's, you know, it's one of those get focused, stay focused, you know, and, and don't try to do it in, in, in five minutes. And I, I think that's the important part for T-Mobile, which is we're in it for the long haul. John, any parting words, parting words of wisdom? People, would it be possible for people in the audience to take the principles that you've learned at T-Mobile or applied at T-Mobile and, and, and really uh, apply them to their own businesses? I, listen, this, in this group, it's, it's um, you know, I, I think it's who, who you are. Um, but I think one of the things that I've learned here is, you know, is, is especially in, a, in, in corporate settings, uh, but I step out. I mean, I, I think it, the world is waiting so much for people to just step out. You know, and, it, and in my employees, my employees wanted Batman more than they want, you know, uh, some politician to come in. And I would, I would say, whether it's Twitter, whether it's kind of uh, setting lofty goals, how you behave, take it to the extreme. And, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's the dreams of what you yeah. all have, and that's what I'm trying so to do. So just circling back to kind of where we started, where you, you were mentioning kind of the, the German owners of T-Mobile <laughs> and, and their culture. How do it's you, how, do, how does John Ledger fit into the no, uh, culture no. that's with listen, a company with, what are board meetings listen, like with the Germans? Okay, this is, this is, I'll give you one quick story. But I would tell you, listen, in, 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 you know, in, in HR worlds, you are usually assessed on the what and the how. Right? And, and some people who are really good how types, like, you know, when the metric on what you accomplished is not perfect, but the how is great, you survive for long. Uh, trust me, the second my what isn't working, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the sidewalk. Uh, but here's a, here's a good one. German, I, I went to, we had a Deutsche Telekom board meeting, and I don't, you know, I, I was a guest speaker because we're publicly traded now, um, but it was in Warsaw. Now you got to picture a room, we're in Poland, the DT board, the average age is about 118. Uh, and, and, it's, and there's union representation, and they're speaking through those UN microphones there, you know. And so they told me they come because they wanted to hear the status of the uncarrier. So first funny thing was, although they made me promise I wouldn't, I strolled in there with my magenta t-shirt on and some spiked sneakers. and. And they just didn't know, too late. I mean, I'm here, you gotta bring me in. And now it's my turn to speak and it's all simultaneous translation. And this is, Rene Oberman was the CEO and he was on his way out. So I leaned up to the mic and I said, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to comment on Rene Oberman and the great leader that he's been and how instrumental he's been in helping the turnaround of T-Mobile. And I stopped for a second and then I went, okay. Now that that's over, you're never gonna fucking hear me say another positive thing in the future about Renee or anybody else, because let me tell you, the real reason the uncarry is working is me. Me, 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 all me. And, and, then, and then I stopped. Silence. And the only person there was Dave Carey. And I was cracking, it was the funniest thing that's ever happened in my life. And they just sat there looking at me shocked, and then the chairman pressed the button and said, okay, Thank you, John, for your opening comments. Can you move on? <laughs> but see, that's been, that, that's been our love affair. But we went public at about $15 a share, and I think we're trading up near 30, and you know, the company's doing extremely well, so I can do whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So the, yeah. the actual the actual real reason that it's we three stooges. The, 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 no. <laughs> I don't, yeah. So the, the real reason we prepared this slide was for this question. Which of these three guys would you most like to have a beer with, and what would you tell him? Are you shitting me? Marcel is a billionaire, and he hangs around with J-Lo. Who are you going to do? He's, the guy's got a billion bucks, which I know today wasn't a big deal, because you paraded all those guys up here with that shitload of money. But Randall's really smart, but he's boring, and he hangs around in Washington, where I'm not leading. Lowell's running a gigantic company, but you never hear him, right? He's hiding. Marcelo's swinging the bat. You know, he's an interesting guy. And, and I think most importantly, you know, I like that he's swinging the bat. I love Masio Susan. He's a good friend I've known for a long time. And most importantly, what I think you're going to learn in the industry in the near future is uh, fat, dumb, and happy, the guys on the left. We're trying to make you believe that this is T-Mobile and Sprint hitting each other with clubs, but don't worry, you know, pardon those kids behind the curtain. It's bullshit. And we don't need to beat each other to be successful. So I think what you're going to hear is if you watched in the last few weeks, AT&T's big move in their, you know, oh, oh my god, you can have a bunch of data, but not unlimited, don't get crazy. That, you know, who do you think that was at, right? There was a response to Sprint. And if you heard Marcelo, I think Marcelo gave a speech a couple weeks ago and said there was 45 minutes one day where they were net positive in customer additions. And it ain't coming from us. So I think it's, you know, it's coming from you know, Mo and Larry. And, and I think that's, that's, that's not bad, because you know, they start taking a little share. Yeah. And we all want those other guys so, to wake the fuck up. Yeah, so given that, you, it sounds like you do have a lot of respect for this Sprint, new Sprint right. CEO. Yeah. Are, do you regret that the, the Sprint uh, T-Mobile merger didn't come together? And would you consider? Well, not me. He would, got a job. Yeah, he got a job yeah. out of it. That's yeah. true. Well, no, would you I, consider a new offer if listen, it came to came yeah. to the table the, somehow? The the logic of consolidation makes huge sense. I think the chairman of the FCC had made has made it very clear in his victory lap, especially, that you know no, you know not not right now. Yeah. Um, and then you got the auctions. The AWS three auctions are going on right now. Then you got the broadcast auctions if they all come forward. And I think that's, you know, that raises the question, but not just Dish. I mean, what's, I mean, not just Sprint, but what about Dish? And what's going to happen with Google? You think they're not going into this business? What about Facebook? What about Amazon? You know, what about Telmex now that they're not having a love affair with AT&T anymore? I mean, there's, you know, wh what I've learned in industries is give ourselves a break. Do we, especially you guys with the technology that could change, do we really think that us and those three are what's going to dominate the industry of the next five years? I mean, I think we will look back in five years and we will find it hilarious that we thought that the four major carriers were going to control this industry. You know, there'll be pieces of them existence, but it'll be a completely different space. Yeah, so do you see DISH or anybody else coming in, somebody outside the wireless industry to come in and potentially combine with you? Listen, there, do, does T-Mobile make sense with various partners in the evolution of the industry, of course. But right now, we're extremely valuable from a standpoint of how we're growing. We're growing faster than anybody else in the industry. So from a shareholder standpoint, tremendous value will accrue by continuing as to what we're doing. However, you know, there are various scenarios of people coming together. Like, come on, Dish has a pant load of spectrum you know, and content. And so yeah, these things make sense. But the difference about T-Mobile is that we're not waving a flag saying, hey, you know, come get us. That's just not, that's well, just not the state we're in. In a lot of ways, that makes you more attractive as, a, as an acquisition. And as a brand and as a company, and, and most importantly, what we're doing. You know, I still think, and, and we can all, you know, I hope you're going to stay and have a drink, because that's the only reason I came, is, um, <laughs> you know, we can, we can debate, but there's a place for T-Mobile. And we're going to continue to cause change. And right now, you know, I think we're a, we're a fascinating brand that's accruing significant values. Silly things like Twitter, they're not silly. What we do on Twitter, we've got a relationship that's growing with customers. And that is something that uh, many people are interested in. Yeah, that's very good. All right, John Ledger, T-Mobile, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thanks. That was great. Hey, thanks.